Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Rehana Nushirvani. I'm a research associate here at the Freeman Air and Space Institute, and I'll be chairing this session today. A little bit about Freeman. Based out of King's College London School of Security Studies, the Freeman Air and Space Institute, or FASI as we sometimes call it, provides independent and original research and analysis on air and space power issues with the objective to inform scholarly policy and doctrinal debates in a rapidly evolving strategic environment. To learn more about our work and keep abreast of upcoming events and publications, please sign on to our mailing list. Additionally, please save the date for our summer event taking place at King's College on the evening of June, uh, June 22nd. We will be sending out details to everyone on our mailing list. So again, if you have not already, do sign up via our website or the link posted in this event's chat box by my colleague, Orla. Um, a little bit, a little introduction to today's event and our panelists. Um, this afternoon, we will be discussing our how states address shortcomings in air and air power and air domain capabilities in times of crisis, with a general focus on Ukraine and Russia. The discussion will take approximately an hour. Please feel free to ask questions at any point during the presentation using the Q and A pod or the chat box. We will reserve time at the end of the hour to answer your questions. Today's discussion will be led by our distinguished panelists and recent FASI contributors, Dr. Julia Morovska and Dr. Daniel Salisbury. Julia is an independent defense analyst with 13 years of experience leading research in the fields of defense industry, policy, and technology applications. Until late 2022, she was a research leader in defense and security at RAND Europe. Her most recent publication for FASI is entitled Drones and Defense Innovation in Ukraine, Consolidating Wartime Ingenuity. Um, it examines the Ukrainian civilian and military-led innovations that have enabled the effectiveness of unmanned aerial vehicles on the battlefield. Dr. Daniel Salisbury is a senior research fellow at the Center for Science and Security Studies in the Department of War Studies here at KCL. He is currently undertaking a three-year research project on arms embargoes as part of the Liverpool Trust Early Career Fellowship. Daniel is also an associate fellow at the Royal United Service Institute and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. His recent publication for FASI is entitled Clipped Wings? Question mark. The impact of arms embargoes on Russian air power in Ukraine and beyond. It examines the challenges posed by arms embargoes on Russia's air power and the coping strategies and tactics it may use to mitigate their impact. I'd like to extend my gratitude to both of our panelists for joining us today. And with that, I will hand it over to Julia. Thank you very much, Rehana. Um, I just have a few slides to accompany my uh, brief presentation to start us off. Um, and rather uh, than serving as kind of a, uh, a sort of end-to-end -end, uh, lecture or, or slide deck, they will just present some of the uh, material that I have used to formulate my arguments and to kind of start to examine this pretty complex um, and, um, <laughs> and uh, vibrant um, area of defense innovation in Ukraine. Uh, so I will just pause because, you know, I know that these things happen. And Rehana, can you confirm that you can see my slide that says Ukraine gaining advantage? Okay, excellent. Right. So I would like to uh, start by confessing that even though this is an air power focused forum, uh, my motivation for writing my short piece for FASI that Rehana mentioned as at the start and um, for looking at this topic had more to do with understanding this kind of, you know, multi-layered um, space of innovation in battlefield uh, technologies that is happening in Ukraine um, than with examining the nature um, or future of air power uh, in Russia's war against Ukraine and beyond. Although, of course, these two fields are very closely related and kind of one has led to many uh, discussions of, um, of the other. Um, I thought that UAVs were a perfect uh, case study or lens through which to look at this topic because not only are they a particularly you know, prominent feature of the war, 
uh, but they also raise a number of questions that I mentioned about uh, the future of warfare in general um, and the nature and extent of technological advantage uh, on the battlefield. And also more practically, um, there was just a lot more information that I could access uh, that had to do with UAVs and UAS, uh, unmanned aerial systems uh, in Ukraine than, than in other areas. Um, therefore, I will focus my presentation on the creativity and ingenuity, uh, which whole sections of Ukrainian civil society, as well as the military have displayed um, in adapting commercial and consumer drones for military purposes, in developing bespoke UAVs and UAS um, for the armed forces requirements, and also in collaborating very closely and very dynamically with the so-called um, end users, i.e. the armed forces on the front line, um, in adjusting and improving their designs and uh, ways of operating them. Um, I will also touch on how the government has responded to this adaptation innovation, so how it has also adapted in its own way. Um, and um, hopefully we can have a discussion as well about why it is important um, for Ukraine's partners to support and uh, nurture this innovation. So I will um, start just by outlining that um, even uh, though some or um, many of you may have um, seen um, various Ukrainian volunteer groups uh, crowdfunding for commercial drones for the Ukrainian armed forces, or perhaps um, you have read the press coverage of civilian volunteers um, getting together to experiment with arming consumer drones with grenades to then drop on Russian targets. Um, this is actually a story that um, goes back to 2014. And this is when we have seen the first kind of tech-minded volunteer drone enthusiast groups, um, as I have started calling them, uh, form in Ukraine in order to resist um, Russia's initial invasion and Russian-backed separatism uh, in the Donbass region. Um, and you can also kind of see this reflected in my selection of press articles from that time. Um, these groups started use it, using crowdfunding to purchase more complex UAV systems, um, as well as to adapt uh, commercial drones and to then deliver them to the Ukrainian armed forces, which at the time, were, I think it is fair to say, underprepared um, for Russia fomenting separatism and also under-equipped. They also started um, themselves developing unmanned aerial systems, uh, UAS, um, starting with small so-called um, DIY quadcopters um, and training Ukrainian soldiers to use them. Um, these UAVs were chiefly used for ISR purposes, so for um, intelligence surveillance and um, reconnaissance. And um, this essentially means that they were used to observe and watch um, enemy targets and, and, mo and movements. Um, what is interesting is that a small number of um, these groups actually evolved into established companies that are supplying the armed forces of Ukraine today. Um, and I will actually uh, touch on this later in, in my uh, presentation as well. So what do we uh, have today? And I have already kind of referred to this at the, um, at the start of my presentation. Well, I think the first kind of phenomenon or development um, that I have started paying attention to when I was looking at this in Ukraine um, is just how multi-layered, um, vibrant, and kind of complex the UAV innovation landscape is in Ukraine. Um, within weeks of um, Russia's full-scale invasion a year ago, Ukrainian civilians uh, kind of with techie know-how or engineering backgrounds um, started to self-organize um, to set up drone workshops or drone labs across the country. I have illustrated um, just a couple of examples here, some of which I um, also mention in uh, in my paper that um, I wrote for FASI. Um, it is important to note that uh, these are civilian and volunteer groups, but they're also civilian military 
hybrid um, organizations like Aerorozvitka, which means uh, aerial reconnaissance in Ukrainian. And uh, they're usually crowdfunded and they work uh, or they tend to work very closely and directly with military units. Um, a good example of kind of their creative activities um, is finding ingenious ways to adapt commercial drones, parts, and materials for military use. Um, so this, for example, includes um, equipping grenades to be carried by consumer delivery drones, um, and then dropping them on Russian targets with enough precision and enough strike power to hit individual trenches um, and armored vehicles. This might seem relatively simple when I'm describing it, um, but those of you who have tinkered uh, with um, uh, with consumer drones will know that it is far from simple, far from straightforward. Um, for instance, developing an effective DIY strike drone um, required coming up with a suitable detonator uh, in this case, this particular drone workshop, I think, used a nail and Play-Doh um, and affixing 3D printed um, aerodynamic fins with glue, amongst um, other challenges. I also think I um, read a news article in Ukrainian media about um, dismantling uh, e-cigarettes for batteries, but um, I will I will need to um, follow up on that. But that is just um, that is just to show kind of the level of um, creativity and um, uh, the extent of variation, I think, um, as well as the really technical know how in, in this area. Um, in addition to these various volunteer groups and civic organizations, um, there is also a range of, well, fully fledged um, companies producing UAS um, and supplying the armed forces of Ukraine, uh, which I uh, mentioned earlier uh, in my talk. This is not an exhaustive list, and I should also say, like, none of um, you know the slides kind of present uh, exhaustive lists of what I'm trying to. Uh, to bring to your attention, but it's more an indication of um, what is out there, kind of a representative selection. Um, for example, here you see Ukarabaron Prom, um, which is a state controlled um, defense conglomerate, um, and it has been developing a long range strike UAV. So, you know, as far as Ukrainian defense industry, I mean, this is as big as it gets. Um, a number of these companies, such as Ukraspet Systems and Atlon Avia, have actually grown out of the volunteer groups of 2014-2015 that I um, that I talked about in the beginning, where they have you know their roots um, in these early developments, and um, most of them predate the full-scale invasion, as do many of their solutions. However, um, it is important to know that uh, currently Ukrainian firms uh, firms make up only a min minority um, of the drones um, that are required by the armed forces to try to um, approach you know, decisive military victory. Um, and um, a lot of systems come kind of from abroad as well uh, by Ukraine's partners. Um, what is also interesting and has gained a fair amount of media attention is that um, there has been a lot of startup activity in this space, which you know you might expect. Um, and um, you can see here in my selection of kind of recent um, startups uh, that have gained funding or you know have um, have been able to exploit their uh, innovations. Um, you can see that um, they have been um, active and, and kind of their solutions have been developed after um, or completed after the start of the full scale invasion, which I think you know is revelatory in its own right, um, given the you know the uncertainty, the risk, uh, the myriad of disruptions. Um, in addition to this, I didn't put this on the slide, but um, you know, I, I also kind of noted that there are a number of hobby groups and collectives, um, such as the Ukrainian Association of Drone Owners, um, which developed a counter detection solution for UAVs, um, and the Dnipro Regional Federation of Aero Modeling Sport, which actually developed a pretty lethal um, UAV, which is now being used by the armed forces. And um, reportedly, it's particularly robust against um, enemy uh, electronic warfare threats. 
Um, I think it's important also to to kind of underline that this ethos of experimentation and embrace of technology as a way, by the way, I should underline to, um, you know, to gain advantage against a um, numerically and quantitatively superior enemy in the face of Russia and also um, superior in terms of artillery power. Um, this uh, ethos of experimentation extends to Ukraine's armed forces as well. So for example, um, there are a number of individual um, units that operate their own um, workshops um, dedicated to UAV um, innovation and um, to explosives for uh, for drones. And you know, it is the one that I um, that I included on the slide is is um, not at all a unique example or an isolated example. Um, there's a you know an ongoing and very active quest. Uh, to develop the perfect drone grenade, for example, um, that could be light enough to be carried um, by uh, and dropped by a consumer drone um, worth, you know, uh, several thousand US dollars, but powerful enough to damage a Russian main battle tank, which is worth up to half a million dollars. Um, you know, other units and even at the brigade level uh, have set up their internal IT or innovation hubs um, to solve kind of thorny issues through technology um, around logistics and communications, um, in addition to UAVs and, you know, counter UAV solutions. Um, I think it's important to kind of um, appreciate that what has made a lot of this work is, uh, I mean, there are a number of, I think, trends within kind of broader trends within Ukrainian society um, that permeate to the military that we can, you know, talk about later. But I think um, kind of most relevant to, to this point is that there's an autonomy of, you know, decision making, um, a spirit of experimentation and kind of the startup approach um, amongst the, you know, the lower level um, commanders, as well as instant communication, network communication with, with other units. Um, I, um, I will, you know, I haven't uh, continued with the slides, but I just have kind of another, um, you know, another point to make before, um, before I uh, finish my presentation for today. Um, and that is so far, I have focused on the supply side, so to speak, um, of, um, of innovation. Uh, but it's important to note that um, the, um, the demand side, um, so the government and the Ministry of Defense have also been adapting and um, responding to it. You know, firstly, there is a greatly simplified well, I will call it a procurement procedure, uh, but then I will kind of explain what it is. And I think um, you will see, you know, the, the ingenuity of it. So there's a greatly simplified procurement procedure for existing UAVs and also kind of acquisition methods for UAVs and other innovations um, that are still in development. So essentially there's a dedicated website and an email um, address created um, for kind of producers and developers to apply for exploitation of their um, technologies by the armed forces of Ukraine. And then this will uh, open the door uh, to purchase of these demonstrators and um, eventually inclusion in the inventory of the armed forces. Um, and, um, you know, during one month in um, late 2022, the Ministry of Defense um, announced that uh, it has accepted seven types types of domestic UAVs for exploitation. Um, and, um, you know, this is compared to kind of one, two uh, UAV types per year during, during the uh, pre-war period. Um, in, um, in December of last year of 2022, there were also um, 19 more applications from uh, Ukrainian producers that were uh, being reviewed. In addition to this, um, the Ministry of Digital Transformation in Ukraine has also been um, active in this area. So you, some of you might have heard of the uh, Drone Army Initiative, um, which is a joint initiative of the General Staff of the Armed Forces, uh, Ministry of Digital uh, Transformation and um, United, the United 24, the official uh, fundraising platform, United 24 of the Ukrainian government. 
to kind of build up Ukraine's uh, drone arsenal. Um, there is um, help for defense startups um, in general, and um, obviously this includes um, UAV startups. They are in fact a prominent feature of the startup um, landscape in Ukraine. Um, so the Minister of um, of uh, digital transformation of Ukraine uh, announced plans to help domestic drone manufacturers uh, kind of solve uh, component supply problems uh, by creating supply hubs. Um, and um, the Ministry of Digital Affairs um, actually has uh, reoriented the Ukrainian startup fund um, to specifically fund um, military technologies uh, and effect effectively distributes um, grants to, to startups. Um, so as you can see, it really is a, you know, it's a complex uh, space, it's a vibrant space. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of themes that we can take from this. Um, you know, one side kind of has to do with, um, with uh, defense innovation, um, you know, in general, in UAVs, of course, specifically, but also in general, and kind of uh, what the Ukrainian experience um, reveals, such as, you know, how important and how difficult to achieve, actually, um, two-way communication between volunteers and end users is, or developers and end users, um, how essential that kind of, you know, continued feedback is to iterative improvement, um, you know, the potential, I guess, but also the limitations of um, consumer technologies, kind of consumer of the shelf technologies, uh, the engagement of civil society in this effort, uh, what it takes, you know, to kind of set up and run um, these uh, drone workshops or these drone labs that I talked about. Um, and of course, you know, what this all means, right? What this means for, um, Ukraine's defense of its territory for any counter offensive that may happen for Ukrainian victory, but also more um, conceptually for the future of air power or, um, you know, the, um, the future of, uh, of warfare. You know, we've seen kind of a debate about whether or not the tank is obsolete, whether the next war will be a war of drones. Um, I mean, I have, um, I am a gen I'm going to go ahead and, and, and call myself as a general skeptic about these types of pronouncements, but of course, you know, we do see some important changes taking place. Um, and I hope we can pick up some of these themes in the discussion. Uh, I, will, I will conclude now and um, look forward to, um, to talking with you and also to Dan's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. I'm just going to share my screen now. Hopefully this works. Um, so yeah, th thanks for that. It was really interesting. Um, I'm seeing some nodding, which is which is positive. Um, I, my, my presentation, I guess, is a little bit more of a, a kind of a formal presentation uh, based on the paper that I wrote uh, and the contents of it. Um, you know, apologies for that. Um, but uh, I promise there's at least some, some good pictures in there as well. Um, so I thought I'd begin um, just just to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about. I'll provide a little introduction to the, the paper, um, the, the, the question that I was addressing, uh, a little bit of historical context of embargoes and, and air power in, 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 in past, uh, past cases. Uh, and then I'll, I'll try and sh uh, explain uh, the, the lessons and, and the kinds of insights that I derived by looking at historical embargoes, developed a little bit of a framework in, in that respect. And then I will try and uh, say what, what I think this means for, for, for Russia and, and, and Russia's war, war in Ukraine. Um, so, so just a little bit about my, myself and my background. Um, I, I kind of started off as, as a bit of an accidental nuclear historian in a way, looking at the, the British nuclear case. Um, but a lot of my work has been on export controls and illicit networks and, and, and the ways that states get hold of technology that, that others are trying to prevent them from getting hold of. Um, I got funded by the Leverhulme Trust a few years ago to, to start a large uh, three-year project on arms embargoes. Um, and, and I've always had an interest in aircraft and aviation. Um, and, and I think it, it is really one of the places where arms embargoes can, uh, can kind of most visibly cut 
through and in, in, because of a number of reasons that, that I'll, I'll talk about. So now I kind of think I've gone a bit from being an accidental nuclear historian to being a little bit of an air power tourist. Um, so, you know, any softball questions on air power are gratefully received. Um, so the paper is about arms embargoes, um, but I, I also think it is about adaptation uh, and, and essentially state responses to, to uh, arms embargoes. And obviously it involves humans working with technology in the aviation space. So, so I think it does talk to Julia's work in, in, in some ways as well. Um, so obviously I don't need to provide too much context about Russia's uh, illegal war in Ukraine. Um, but uh, you know, Russia has been subjected to various arms embargoes over the years. You know, throughout the Cold War, uh, it was cut off from a lot of technology uh, from the West through through things like uh, COCOM. Um, before 2022, when the the full scale uh, invasion attempt occurred, um, you know, there were various embargoes in place. I think the EU put in place an arms embargo after the the, the Crimea uh, seizure in 2014. Um, but since the uh, the full scale invasion in, in February 2022, we've seen uh, you know a massive kind of tightening of these these kinds of these kinds of restrictions, uh, moving from arms increasingly to to kind of different areas of dual use technology of of use to defence, uh, but also other uh, commercial industrial sectors. Um, we've seen a lot of efforts to tighten this over over time, um, and we've got some data on on the challenges and responses to these embargoes here, but but a lot of it's fairly limited. Um, and in the aviation context, obviously, uh, you know, Russia is trying to fight a war. Um, and, and with this comes a lot of other stresses, stresses and pressures on, on the wartime air force. Um, so, so the question really I, I wanted to ask is, you know, given that we, we have some insights into what's going on in, in the Russian aerospace forces, um, you know, are there any lessons that we can learn from historical cases here about how states cope? And embargoes and air forces, um, you know, I'm taking a really kind of broad definition here. I'm not just uh, looking at cases where states have declared an embargo. Um, I'm also kind of talking about embargoes that are not in name through through export controls and other uh, technology restrictions. Um, you know, we've we've seen uh, these used against air forces and air power from the earliest days. Um, a couple of examples here. You know, I was looking into the Eth development of the Ethiopian Air Force in the 1920s and 1930s, and there was a lot of restriction there on, on technology be provided by the uh, the sort of European powers. Um, and the Versailles Treaty uh, on, on the, the restrictions on re German rearmament after the First World War um, did also create kind of a lot of uh, pressures and, and a lot of inventive ways of getting around them, uh, including these, these glider clubs. Um, Air power is is challenging. Um, you know, high. We're getting very much higher barriers to, to entry now than in these cases. Uh, you know, it's all about very complex systems of systems, um, and and you know, a lot of great great stresses and pressures. Uh, you know, physically on on the materials involved. Um, you know, in, in my mind, uh, this makes air power kind of a really interesting place to look at the the impact of embargoes and and ask really, is this where arms embargoes can bite? Um, so, so what I did was I, I, I looked at some historical cases and I, I tried to kind of put together a framework, which is, uh, you know, in the paper on, on the left here that you can uh, find on the FASI website. And, and my main kind of framework is, is on the right here. And what I tried to do is to sort of think, OK, how have states historically responded over time? Are there um, kind of similarities between the ways that different states responded? Um, you know, what, what really shaped those responses? Um, and I guess the, the 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 meat of this really is 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 what I've kind of termed uh, coping strategies and, and tactics. And um, uh, two main strategies here are kind of dependency strategies. So that's where a state isn't really able to produce a lot of this stuff domestically. Uh, you know, as we're limits on capability there, so it's having to do things like uh, stockpile, uh, cannibalize older airframes, and, and also try and get around the embargo in terms of procurement. And then self-sufficiency, uh, you know, states have a larger uh, domestic industrial capability. Um, they, they might be able to uh, you know, produce their own airframes, produce their own spare parts, and even, even go as far as, as, as innovating. Um, I looked at the time frame. So uh, stockpiling, for example, is, is a pre-embargo strategy, whereas the others are something that you can do uh, during the embargo. Um, and also, yeah, the biggest factor, I guess, in, in some sense, is the technological capability of, of the states from very basic to, to sophisticated. Um, so uh, just to kind of illustrate this a little bit, a couple of the uh, cases that I looked at that I thought could be 
uh, kind of interesting to share. Um, so Iran is kind of a, a nice a nice case, uh, you know, embargoed after the 1979 uh, revolution, um, and and before that, uh, under the the uh, Shah's um, regime or rule, um, they procured a vast number of U.S. origin uh, combat aircraft, um, and about 95 percent of the of the Iranian uh, Imperial Air Force at that time was was imported from the U.S. And this included uh, F-4s and F-5s, which we see all over the world. Um, you know, very easy to get spare parts for those uh, on, on on the black market. Uh, but also the Tomcat uh, F-14, which Iran was the only operator outside of the, the U.S. Navy. Um, so the 1979 revolution saw a, a spare parts cut off, but also a lot of support as well. I think there are about 800 or more Grumman technicians in, in country working on Tomcat that all, all, all left. Um, and immediately uh, the, the Iranian Air Force had to start cannibalizing its, its airframes, uh, a lot of kind of elaborate efforts to buy uh, very spare parts on black markets. Um, and also uh, sought to kind of procure complete aircraft from other suppliers when it was available to that was able to um so, so a good example there is is the you know, large amount of aircraft that left iraq on on the eve of the gulf war um and i've got a couple of uh documents here that the cia um uh, kind of crest uh, freedom of information uh, reading room is really interesting here uh you can find uh kind of their assessments of where the air force was so um, a lot there in 1980, uh, talking about the the F-14 and, and the, the kind of uh, critical questions about how to obtain desperately needed spare parts and technical assistance. And, and then another example from 1984, um, which talks about two thirds of Iran's invention, inventory being non-operational. And, and you've got to remember, they were also fighting the, the Iran-Iraq war at the time. Um, so also under sort of similar pressures um, there. Um, there, there have been more, some more recent efforts to explore self-sufficiency in the case, but a lot of these uh, machines look quite similar to, to things like the F, F5. Um, and actually, Iran was under an arms embargo in some form uh, 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 as, a, as a result of the nuclear standoff and from 2010 to 20, 2020. And we're talking, or well, people are talking about a deal by Russia to sell attack aircraft to them now. And, and, and so this embargo and its effects really have endured a lot over time. Um, a second example that I want to talk through a little bit with South Africa, I think this falls a little bit more on, on moving towards self-sufficiency. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to be in South Africa a, a few weeks ago and, and was able to go and see some of these uh, systems in, in various museums and on kind of a, a crowded uh, hangars on, on, on air bases and, and that kind of thing. Um, and here I think we had a, more attempts to maintain and, but, and also to, to sort of move towards replication or innovation. Um, you know, South Africa obviously developed a huge industrial base um, at the time under embargo. Uh, and a lot of this capability in the aviation uh, space came, I think, from license production arrangements in, in, in the 1960s that were, were transferred uh, before the embargo. And I guess one of the most famous examples was the, um, the Atlas Cheetah, which was an upgraded version of the Mirage 3 that it obtained from France. And, and and was able to upgrade with Israeli support. So that a nice picture of there on the top uh, right. Um, but but a variety of other domestic projects too. And and I think um, you know by the time that um, the, South, the the apartheid regime collapsed and and um, you know South Africa really was moving towards uh, you know self sufficiency in some ways. Um, the Danel Rivok uh, helicopter, for example. Um, is, is something that, that, that is a sort of fairly unique indigenously designed capability. And there was talk as well of a fourth generation uh, a fighter jet that, that was cancelled in the early 90s too. Um, and Arms Corps obviously continues to exist, you know, and South Africa, I guess, has almost a, an oversized defence industry, um, I guess, as a result of its time under embargo. Um, so where does Russia fit in with this? I mean, it's it's a little bit different from some of the cases that I explore in the paper. Um, you know, I explore everything from uh, Rhodesia to South Africa to Iran to Iraq to North Korea. Um, and, and Russia really, you know, it has a large and advanced defense industrial base, you know, unlike many of these other cases. It's a fast jet manufacturer since the late 1940s in some sense. And um, it hasn't been directly dependent on other states' industrial capabilities in terms of uh, design and manufacture of aircraft. But um, we do have evidence that there is still some dependency there for constituent technologies. 
Um, so particularly talking about things like electronic components and, and various manufacturing technologies. Um, and so I guess Russia in, in this way is, is, is kind of going to use some strategies that are based on dependency and some that are based on self-sufficiency. If you, you go back to my, to my framework that I presented earlier. Um, just to kind of talk a little bit about this history of dependency. Um, so, so obviously, um, you know, throughout the Cold War, there were massive efforts by the Soviets to, to gain access to Western technology. And I think the time that, um, that we really learned a lot more about this was in the early 80s. Um, so, so the, the gentleman on the, on the right there, Vladimir Vitrov, uh, was a, a Soviet um, kind of intelligence officer, and he had been involved in what was known as the Lion X program, which was to, to procure um, Western technology uh, using almost any means available. Um, and so in 1981, he, he betrayed uh, his country and he handed over thousands of Lion X documents uh, to the French intelligence services which were then uh, passed over to, to, the, to the US and circulated amongst allies and, and, and led to the uh, kind of Western intelligence assessment of, of a massive, well-organized campaign by the Soviet Union to acquire Western technology illegally and legally for its weapons and military equipment projects. And, and some of the projects that they mentioned in, in, in these documents included a fighter aircraft, a ground attack aircraft, and also transport aircraft. Um, so I think this is, you know, something that that, that seems quite um, quite far away in a sense. But um, you know, after looking at some of the wreckage that was taken off the uh, the battlefields of Ukraine, um, you know, maybe not so 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 far in the past. Um, another example that, that I found that, that kind of betrays at least some dependency is is the um, transfers of French technology uh, before and after uh, 2014. Um, it's included things like navigation systems, cockpit display screens, uh, viewfinders um, for, for various different aircraft, and it caused a bit of a political scandal. Um, and I, I've heard as well that, that some of the um, some of the, the systems and, and, and kind of uh, operating systems on these aircraft also use kind of similar uh, patterns of logic to to the these French systems. So um, you know what what are we seeing from Ukraine? Um, you know. The, the the Soviet Union or, or well now Russia has has taken a, a lot of uh, expended a lot of effort to try and indigenize production of a lot of these types of technologies um, you know to, to try and domestically produce um, some of these electronic components and stuff and kind of proof itself against uh, sanctions and, and embargoes um, but um, you know since the invasion a lot of the uh, wreckage and, and thing things that have been taken off the battlefield uh, analyzed uh, by various people has shown uh, you know vast amounts of western components in these systems um, you know a lot of these as well are, are kind of household names in electronics that, that we we all know um, there has been less evidence with regard to the aircraft um, i think there have been much fewer losses in this area you're talking about 60 to 70 uh, fast jets that have been lost well, compared to, I think I read it the other day, over a thousand uh, T-72 tanks. Um, but uh, we, we have a, do have a kind of a growing data set in this regard. And an example here that I took from, from Twitter um, of an SU-24M uh, that, that was, uh, you know, part, part of the wreckage was also full of, of these Western components. So I think, uh, you yeah, know, we, we will, we'll, almost certainly seeing Russia uh, stockpiling and cannibalizing um, your stockpiling before the embargo came into place. And you know, a degree of this is normal, um, but obviously stockpiling with intent, uh, one worrying, I guess, about future contingencies when uh, the, and future sanctions come into place uh, is, is slightly different from, from stockpiling for other reasons. And you're gonna see cannibalization to, to a higher degree. Uh, we haven't seen a huge amount of evidence in the military space with can cannibalization, um, but it's something that we definitely are seeing a lot of talk of in the civilian aerospace sector where a lot of aircraft are Boeing and, and, and Airbus. Um, in terms of illicit procurement, uh, we're seeing a lot of evidence of illicit procurement networks in action. Um, some of this relates to uh, aircraft and, and the procurement of, of aviation technology. And I just provide one example here from October 2022, uh, which was a, a kind of interesting mixed network where uh, five Russian nationals and, and two oil traders were, were indicted. Um, 
They were procuring uh, sensitive military and dual-use technologies from U.S. manufacturers, including advanced semiconductors, microprocessors used in fighter aircraft, missile systems, and other things. And, and they were also involved in the trade in Venezuelan oil, which is kind of an interesting mixed aspect of this network. Uh, obviously, at the same time, you've got a lot of wartime stresses and pressures and, and also corruption that are feeding into this. Um, uh, I think when, once once you enter wartime, a lot of the standard maintenance checks and, and um, you know, I guess general general maintenance that you do on airframes uh, kind of goes either out of the window or is on very much reduced schedules. And, and also the, the general risk appetite of these organizations has to change in some way. Um, and we are seeing, I think, some signs of this. Um, so there have been an increasing number of, uh, of airframes lost outside of combat. Um, and Justin Bronk recently put uh, together a great report on the kind of state of, uh, of current uh, aviation in, in, in the war. Um, and he said, you know, each, each one uh, may be individually explained by bird strikes, pilot error or technical failures. However, collectively, they suggest that eight months of war have taken a toll in terms of accumulated airframe and aircrew fatigue. Um, we've also talked a lot about uh, the impacts of corruption and seen a lot of that kind of stuff on social media. Um, a lot of this, I think, related to expendable items where the accounting systems are a little bit easier to, to trick. Um, but also uh, we've seen other other kind of um, technical fixes like the, the sat nav that's uh, G-clamped to the to the instrument panel there in that picture. Although I, you know, speaking to um, to some uh, former Air Force officers, they said that they, the, the the Brits did this in, in Kosovo as well. And it, it's not just purely about corruption. You know, there are other other kind of morale connected uh, uh, thing things to do with this, perhaps. And um, but yeah, I think it is really difficult in some sense to differentiate between the impacts of the embargo, other wartime pressures and stresses, and, and also just general organizational issues. Um, so as far as, as I'm aware and, and from uh, digging through some Russian language sources, um, Russia is still producing SU-35s. Um, some new airframes were handed over last year. Um, so production hasn't completely stopped. Um, and you know maybe this is a, an effect of the stockpiling strategy. Um, but I think from, from my understanding, the biggest impacts of the embargo will like, be, be in the medium to the longer term. And also on on some of the next generation projects that are already already stretched and, and already kind of failing to produce in in the planned timeframes, um, and I guess this is probably because they rely on more advanced uh, foreign and imported technologies, um, especially in the areas of electronics and and, and manufacturing equipment. Um, and so I guess this does does lead to some questions about the future of Russian air power and the future relevance of the Russian aerospace forces. Um, so Russia is obviously struggling to compete with NATO's uh, air power now. Um, and, and one of the questions that came up in, in, in discussions for this paper was really, um, you know, what does an embargo do? Does, does 10 years of embargo set you back 10 years or does it potentially send you back uh, 20 years or more? Um, in terms of helping the embargo to bite, and this is kind of what I, I do a lot in my uh, you know, separate to, to, to my work on, on, on Russia's air forces and aviation. Um, you know, there are a, a lot of uh, more resources, a lot of effort that's gone into kind of enforcing these uh, export controls um, and sanctions. Um, you know, there are huge challenges here in engaging the private sector. And I think a lot of this relates to the, to the nature of the electronics industry, uh, the dual use issue. Um, the, the, the way that distributors are so prominent in these supply chains, and some of them are, are um, you know, distributing uh, millions of different unique products. Um, there's obviously a prominent role for certain hubs for electronic procurement, so Hong Kong and China stick out in these supply chains. And also there's the challenge that, that many states uh, Either either don't care about the sanctions, or, or they they have reasons that they don't want to kind of get involved and, and join the the Western sanctions coalition. Um, and I wrote a, a piece a little more focused on on uh, the role of the private sector here at a Rusi um, blog um, last last summer. So so if you're interested in this, um, I, I'd point you in that direction. Um, but just to conclude, uh, you know I think one of the biggest factors here in terms of the future. 
uh, in terms of the uh, the outcome of the war in Ukraine and in terms of the um, the future state of the Russian aerospace forces is really the China factor. Um, you know, so China so far has supplied some dual use technologies. Uh, we've seen news stories that, that are based on trade data that show that some of these dual use technologies are flowing uh, from China to Russia. Um, you know, China, as well as being a producer, is obviously one of these key nodes in these types of supply chains. Um, so, so one of these stories did talk specifically about $1.2 million worth of parts for SU-35 uh, that were transferred from a major uh, Chinese state-owned uh, enterprise. Uh, but China so far has stopped short of supplying complete weapon systems uh, into, the, into the conflict zone and into Russia. Um, you know, I, I guess there's a discussion and, and, and kind of noise in the media about what future transfers could include and, and drones, or I don't like the term, but kind of kamikaze drones, the suicide drones, the type that we've been, or similar to the type that we've been seeing transferred by Iran, uh, was something talked about as, as a potential transfer from China. Um, and obviously, um, uh, Xi Jinping and, and, and Putin met in February 2022, just before the war started. Um, and talked about a no limits partnership, and, and I think there is discussion of a, of a future future meeting in the next month or so uh, between the two leaders. So, uh, a big question here is where does China want to position itself, and and, and what what are the impacts going to be? Um, so, just to conclude um, with some thoughts on, on on adaptation, that maybe talk a little bit to to Julia's uh, presentation. Um, you know, obviously, wielding air power is, is 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 based on humans and organizations and networks as much as it is based around uh, technology, um, and and the ability to adapt is also hugely important. And so, I was thinking, you know, adaptation actually is really important at all levels. Uh, when you're in a situation uh, under great pressure to deliver, um, you know, issues with uh, supply chains. Um, issues with getting uh, technology through, uh, not being able to kind of do things in, in the normal way that you would in peacetime. Um, so the ability of Air Force leadership, Air Force structures and officers to adapt, uh, technicians and mechanics, uh, whether this is uh, how they adapt their programs or even, even just finding short-term uh, fixes to small small problems in, in the airframes and, and in, in the tech itself. And then also procurement organizations and networks, um, you know, how are these adapting? Um, I like the concept of resilience. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of used in the business world as the ability to bounce back from, from various types of shocks. Um, but I guess embargo is also just one source of, of these kinds of shocks um, alongside all these other things that we've discussed with the wartime pressures and, and losses, uh, economic and political pressures, uh, issues to do with corruption, all that kind of stuff. Um, but but I guess at the end of the day, uh, really healthy organizations and strong organizational culture are key to, to being able to, to be resilient. Um, and it was interesting in, in Julia's presentation when she's talking about some of these new structures that had been having like really big effects uh, with, with some of the, the drone technology. Um, I guess one of the questions that, that would be quite interesting is, is our, 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 tra our, our traditional um, uh, you know, larger hierarchical organizations as good as dealing with these these kinds of issues as as, as some of the smaller ones. Um, so I think that's that's me. Uh, so I'll pass back to to Ray and and share my share my screen. Thank you so much, both of you. That was a fascinating um, presentation. I actually personally have a couple questions, but then I'll go to the audience um, if that's okay. Um, so. I'll just present both my questions, if that's okay. So for Julia, in your presentation, you've implied that Ukraine's international partners in NATO and beyond should support the defense innovation currently taking place in Ukraine. Um, the West is already supporting Ukraine with weapons and training. Can you explain what the value would be in doing this? And then just, if you can put a pin in that for Dan, there's been a lot of discussion recently about new technology controls in on China. In this, um, is this also part of an attempt to constrain air power? And will we see any new multilateral control arrangements in this regard? Can you also kind of comment on what happened recently? Um, the Financial Times, it was last week, it said that US just issued sanctions on Chinese companies for supplying parts to in Iranian drones. Um, 
Sure. Yeah. No, thanks, Ray. Those are really, um, really fascinating questions. And um, um, yes, it's it's not a um, well, it, yes, it's everything about this situation. It's a bit of a complex answer, I guess. Um, I think to understand why the West or Ukraine's, you know, allies in NATO and beyond should support um, defense innovation in Ukraine in UAVs, in robotics and beyond, you really have to kind of segment it a little bit. So I think firstly, if you talk about the immediate um, operational need or the immediate operational requirement of the Ukrainian armed forces, I mean, you know, UAVs, um, you know, drones, whatever you want to call them, loitering munitions, um, uh, have been really essential to uh, to Ukraine's defense, to the counter offensives, um, particularly in the ISR um, capacity. So, you know, they obviously reduce the need to go beyond enemy lines, for instance, to gather intelligence. Um, you can, from, you know, a, like an individual unit position, you can spot um, a potential convoy of um, Russian armored vehicles approaching. Um, approaching your position. So they're really kind of um, the eyes of the armed forces. They direct and correct artillery strikes of Ukraine. And you know, if you've been following the news, which I'm sure everyone on here has been, um, you know, you know that Ukraine uh, is facing a major um, artillery constraint. So it really cannot afford to waste any strikes and, and um, uh, strike accuracy is, is important. I think the most important thing is that Ukraine, the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense is very focused on preserving life. I mean, we do not see Russia have this constraint, right? Um, um, and um, preserving life of the um, uh, of its um, armed forces, and and due to um, you know, still the technical limitations of um, many drones, the operators have, have to actually be quite close to the front line. So they're very, um, very exposed. Um, and of course, the drones uh, are not uh, alone in the airspace, right? It's a very contested airspace. There are a lot of vulnerabilities that they face. There are a lot of Russian drones as well. I mean, recently, the Economist had an article about, um, well, a dogfight between a Ukrainian and, um, you know, and a, and a Russian drone. So currently, you actually see uh, drones trying to strike each other. Um, so that's to say that the you know the average life of a drone especially these kind of adopted commercial drones um on the front line is two to three weeks and basically the point is that ukraine needs a lot of them um and um you know a number of kind of sophisticated complex um military drones have been supplied by the west but simply it's just not enough for all of the operational need you know the strike and the isr so i think you have seen from my presentation that um while a lot of um, systems that Ukrainian industry is developing do have quite long um, lead times, you know there are already others that are in uh, that are operationally ready or that have been developed relatively quickly and are being exploited. So um, you know you have kind of, if you if you can actually accelerate that and help that and help the Ukrainian development uh, community and the Ukrainian industry to fill that operational need then of course that's a huge short term benefit but in addition to that there are medium term and long term benefits i think to the west as well as to ukraine um so defense innovation is essential to a uh, you know a sustainable and a healthy defense industry that can actually fulfill the requirements of the armed forces and you know ultimately prevent a war of aggression such as um, we see Russia waging. So in terms of you know building Ukraine's um, post-war long-term security and future, a robust defense industrial base is absolutely essential. And I think if we have seen anything, it's that Ukraine cannot really rely on um, supplies of weapon systems uh, from, from abroad, you know, when it needs to, of the type that it needs to, and the quantity that it needs to, and the time period that it needs to. So defense innovation, uh, innovation is a way of, um, of achieving that. And lastly, you know, I think Ukraine actually has a lot to, um, I think, to share with the West in terms of lessons. I have been working on defense innovation for a long time. And, you know, it, time after time, it's, this, it's very similar issues, right? It's kind of, stovepiped um, organizations within, uh, you know, within the defense ecosystem that actually make absorption 
um, and uh, adoption adoption of um, of new technology is really complicated, you know, and that kind of um, that kind of gap that exists between all of the innovation we see in the commercial space and the defense space is really wide, and that's an issue for everyone. And Ukraine, uh, in the West, I mean, Ukraine has been quite effectively closing that gap, overcoming that gap. Um, so I think there is a lot that Ukraine can share, you know, in addition to obviously um, testing a lot of this technology uh, in the field. You know, I mean, flying a drone in the U.S. desert is, is not the same as um, having enemy trying to, you know, interdict it or trying to shoot it down. And that's, um, you know, that's experience that Ukraine can share with the West. That's amazing. Um, that's fascinating. Sorry for the long-winded answer. I, oh. I, have, I feel strongly about some of these things. <laughs> yeah. that you should. Um, Dan, did you want to comment on that or can you actually answer the, uh, you can also just answer the question I asked earlier. Do you want me to repeat that though? It was uh, about uh, China. Yeah. 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 Um, so here's another long-winded answer. Um, I, so yeah, China, China in this is, I think, really, really fascinating. Um, you know, obviously, it's just kind of a key strategic competitor or emerging as a key strategic competitor with the with the US. Um, you know, obviously, I guess, I guess it has some uh, interest in keeping uh, other other US allies tied down in, in Europe and, and uh, you know, other allies uh, defense expenditure tied down in, in Europe. Um, it's a power on the rise, where, whereas I get the sense that, that Russia is, is really declining and declining, uh, you know, more rapidly. Uh, by the day um but also the, the role that it has in, in markets you know it's the huge huge market um for for, for exports uh, from all over the place uh, and just generally in, in supply chains as well um just just due to its sheer size and and the, the way that its economy is developing and and it's increasingly a technology producer as well so there's there's a whole range of different kind of roles that it plays in this in this picture um, obviously, the, the West and and and, um, and the US are very concerned about China's military progress and and are trying to to constrain that as well. Um, but but as well, they're also probably worried about the possible supply of, of arms and jewelry technology to Russia. Um, and so, um, you know, Ch China. I feel like the defense industry is still uh, greatly dependent on on advanced uh, electronic components as well. Uh, in a similar way to, to how Russia is, and so uh, you know, Biden's new semiconductor controls on semiconductors, um, it, it relates, I guess, to all, all, all range of, of defense-related uh, projects, including including aviation projects, um, and these these uh, controls on on semiconductors and. Uh, the U.S. has really tried to start to multilateralize these, um, but but given the nature of these these kinds of supply chains and the the uh, you know, immense importance of a small number of countries, uh, places like Japan and the Netherlands and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, the efforts to multilateralize these controls has been quite kind of focused at the moment. Um, I guess people may be wondering whether we might see some kind of new COCOM-like arrangement emerging. And so COCOM was the uh, multilateral export control arrangement uh, between kind of NATO countries and Japan and I think possibly Australia. Um, during during the Cold War, um, and it was a real kind of informal operation run out of Paris, where uh, if, if states wanted to export stuff that was on the lists to to the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact, they would they would uh, you know seek the approval of the other other members. Um, and I think coming up with something like this that is overarching uh, is even more challenging in this climate. Um, you know, it was challenging uh, during the Cold War because. Uh, the position between the between the U.S. and 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 the the, the, the uh, Eastern Bloc, and the Europeans in the Eastern Bloc was very different. You know, the Europeans, due to geography and other factors, had a lot more connections with with Russia, and it was quite difficult to to kind of um, uh, get get them to to refuse to send stuff sometimes. And I think China's got an even more kind of central position in these in these global supply chains and and and, and markets and and that kind of thing. Um, so, so I think it's going to be really difficult. Um, the um, the Iranian drones. Um, so it was this, this was sanctions on entities in China. Yeah, yeah. So um, on on the Iranian drones, I've I've seen increasing efforts by the US and and partners to really um, to try and hit uh, Iran's industry. 
in, in this regard. We've seen a lot of sanctions and designations and, and uh, export controls and, and other, other tools as well. And it's, it, it isn't really that surprising that this has all gone back to China. Um, and, and a lot of this technology that's in these Iranian drones, especially the Shahads uh, 136 and the 131, is pretty basic technology. Um, you know, it only has to really work once. Um, a lot of the engines, uh, because they're propeller-based engines, are actually manufactured by, I think, a company that makes motorcycles, uh, motorcycle engines. Um, and a lot of the technology is is kind of off-the-shelf technology as well um, that, that's easily purchased from, from places like China. So um, I'm not surprised that the U.S. is kind of acting in this way, um, but also uh, it's, it's a really challenging space to actually have any impact in because of the, the sort of ubiquity of, of this of this technology. Yeah, no, that's true. It's fascinating. Um, so Julia, I'm just going to the Q and A box here. So I'm sorry if we're like jumping from topic to topic, <laughs> but um, that's the way to keep it fresh, right? <laughs> that's good. That's Make good. sure that we're listening, right? <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Caught me scrolling um, Twitter. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's for research. Um, so. I'd be interested to hear Julia elaborate on her comments about trends or aspects of Ukrainian society that make the population more open to embracing innovation in the defense area. Yeah, sure. I'll be try to be brief on this one. Um, so I think these trends are probably um, demographic, societal, kind of labor market um, related, and I guess historical. So. Uh, the first thing to say is that Ukraine has a very vibrant and very active um, civil society, which has a really large propensity for kind of self-organizing, right? So that's why you saw a lot of these um, groups kind of emerging and, um, you know, a lot of that, what, what you would... Um, what you would think are state functions have actually been um, done in a grassroots way, um, including, you know, getting some of pretty sophisticated kit um, for the Ukrainian armed forces um, without the involvement of the Ukrainian government. Um, but in addition to that, Ukraine has a very high level of education attainment. Um, it is, it has a very strong history of, uh, you know, STEM, um, education and kind of uh, STEM focus within education. Um, more on the defense industrial side, uh, it has obviously still a very strong legacy of um, Soviet defense industrial production, you know, including in some really sophisticated areas such as complex weapons or um, missiles. Um, and um, I think, you know, more recently, um, kind of after, um, you know, the obviously the fall of the Soviet Union, but also with the emergence of, um, of IT and um, the internet, um, Ukraine has actually really emerged as like an IT powerhouse of, um, of Europe with, you know, really kind of strong uh, engineering backbone. Um, that also happened in Russia, I do have to say. Um, the key difference there, though, is that while, you know, the Russian um, market was large enough to basically sustain a lot of these um, newly minted, you know, highly paid for uh, the local labor market um, IT specialists, uh, Ukraine, you know, didn't have that luxury. So a lot of the Ukrainian kind of um, developers and IT specialists uh, and those just, you know, with um, engineering uh, software skills, um, had to, well, A, learn English, um, you know, to put it very simply, and B, uh, get jobs for international companies. So, um, you know, you see kind of, a, you saw a lot of people work um, for uh, international enterprises and then kind of like bring all of that experience back to join um, the war effort. And obviously that really helped. They developed contacts as well that they were leveraging. Um, and um, coupled with that, um, you know, Ukraine uh, and Ukrainians have, I think it's fair to say, demonstrated that they have a very strong and keen sense of um, independence and um, sovereignty. Um, and that was hugely kind of accelerated in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and um, the Russian backed separatism in, um, in Donbass. So I think all of that kind of coupled um, together, plus, you know, their, um, the Ukrainian government has actually, especially with the Zelensky administration, 
um, has a pretty high risk appetite for, you know, trying digital solutions. So, you know, the, the way, like the life, I guess, of the average Ukrainian is a lot more uh, digital and digitalized when it comes to interaction with, um, you know, any kind of state function or local government function um, than of the average, you know, Brit based on my own experience. So I think it's really kind of a conglomeration of, of all of these trends. No, that's great. Um, Dan, in terms of export substitution, how quickly do you think Russia may be able to address this in terms of defense and defense aerospace? Thanks. That's, that's like, I guess, the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, and I, I, you know, I, I sort of hesitate to, to um, give an authoritative uh, answer uh, specifically because I, I, I'm not, um, you know, if I had a, a more of a, a background in electronic, electric engineering or, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, I, I, you know, one thing that I've observed is that its, it's efforts in this area have been going for a very long time. Um, and a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of communications about this in state media and that kind of thing that they're talking up what, what um, Russia has managed to achieve in this area. Um, and, you know, I think it is quite possible that, that, that there has been some level of success. Um, but then also uh, you see uh, leaked reports. And I think I, I cite a couple of uh, examples in my paper um, where actually uh, a, a lot of the um, components and even even some of the sort of uh, systems that Russia has been producing a long, long time are still are still uh, of, of Western origin. And, and I guess one of the questions that relates to this really is um, it comes up a lot in relation to sanctions and arms embargoes. Is okay, obviously sanctions make life more difficult. You know, having technology cut off makes life more difficult for for states. But does actually the act of having it cut off and having technology refused? Um, does that actually drive um, progress towards uh, sort of indigenization and domestic industry? I think in this case, um, you know, sanctions really won't help. Um, and, and a part of this, I think, is because I imagine that the Russian defense industrial complex is is quite dependent on Western uh, manufacturing technology as, as well as, as, as components. Uh, obviously, um, during wartime, industry is focused on, on many other things. Uh, rather than than uh, kind of indigenization, although the sanctions are going to mean that it is going to have to think about that kind of thing more. Um, but also, um, another part of the equation is that illicit procurement is actually not that difficult. Um, and, and obviously, it's going to become more difficult as the controls get tightened and you get a bit more enforcement and states become a bit more aware. But uh, Russia has been well, you know, well practiced at this. Um, and, and one of the things that I found as well that's quite interesting is looking at other cases of things like North Korea, um, is that actually when you open up uh, North Korean missile wreckage, you, you find uh, Western components in there, but not necessarily stuff that's complex to produce. It's actually Western components that are some of the easier things that they could probably do themselves. Um, but, but maybe they are more interested in the Western components for the same reason that everyone else that isn't under sanctions is interested. You know, maybe they're higher quality, um, easy to procure, uh, it's cheaper to, to buy from someone who, who, who does this as a, as a specialism. Um, so, yeah, really good question. Uh, I'm sorry, that's another rambling answer with that without um, a re real kind of... Uh, you know, X number of years. I I'm surprised to say, sorry, I was just going to say, I, I am surprised when you say that illicit procurement is easy because I don't know, as somebody who like studies defense procurement, right? Um, honestly, it doesn't seem that easy to me. <laughs> I suppose if you're not, if you're not abiding by laws, it kind of reduces a lot of the bureaucracy mm. in some senses as well. Yeah, and, true. Um, but, but yeah. <laughs> I'm, I mean, Maybe, I don't know, I, there's like a lot of questions in the box, but I want to ask a couple questions myself later, but that said, um, so for Julia, have, sorry, uh, have you seen any signs that either Luch, Luch, Luch. Mm -hmm. Luch or Yuzhnoya? Well done, right? Yuzhnoya, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are neighbors. <laughs> um, Design, Bureau, Design Bureau have shown any interest in UAV development. Uh, good question. Yeah, thanks, Ray, for that. Um, 
yeah, those are um, those are kind of you know pre-war and um, fairly well established um, Ukrainian um, well defense outfits, really. Um, I have been specifically looking out for um, Luch. So in, I want to say 2020, Luch unveiled um, a completely, you know, 100% Ukrainian developed, designed and produced um, strike UAV called the Sokil 300, which is um, Falcon 300, which has been called like a Ukrainian an analog or Ukrainian um, you know, version of uh, Bayraktar TB2. Uh, I mean, you can debate whether that's accurate or not, but that's, you know, that's kind of how it has been dubbed. It was um, presented uh, at the, I think, 2021 IDEX um, kind of defense expo in, um, in uh, the UAE. And, you know, you would, th this would really be like, I think, a huge asset to um, the Ukrainian effort um, in this war. Um, you have, you know, I'm sure everyone who's who's still here at this uh, on this webinar will probably have followed like the impact that Bayraktar um, has had, especially the beginning of the war and kind of the initial, you know, defense um, uh, uh, defense against the invasion. Um, what I have been able to to find kind of in the Ukrainian media is that um, it's still undergoing kind of final, you know, trials and tests. It's still not fielded. Um, but apparently the armed forces are, you know, uh, waiting with bated breath because it's a, it's a, it's a real sort of prospect. And, um, I think this is an example, right. Of some of the themes I was talking about, like number one, uh, that traditional, well, yeah, I guess you could call them traditional, but kind of sophisticated, uh, relatively sophisticated complex strike drones, right. That can actually meaningfully strike and not just carry kind of handmade. Uh, or uh, carry grenades in a handmade way, um, do take a long time to develop. They are um, quite important. It also has ISR capability. But um, yeah, from here, you know, unfortunately, I haven't been able to kind of go to Ukraine and do this um, field re research from here. It looks like it's still uh, in, in development, kind of undergoing final testing. No, amazing. Um, I'm kind of consolidating two questions here. Uh, for Julia, can you provide some examples of ways allies can support UAV innovation? And um, to kind of on the tail end of that, have you noted any sort of um, acceleration in EU and particularly German support for Ukraine in this area, perhaps, or more generally, particularly after the tank debacle? Yes. Um, the tank debacle, yes. Although, can I just say that, like, after the tank debacle um, has been addressed by Germany, um, we have not seen the some of the countries who are, you know, were speaking the loudest against Germany follow suit and actually make good on their commitment to um, to make more of those ones. tanks. Well, we can we can leave that. Um, I think discussions, yeah, for for later. Um, no, but I think, um, yes, in terms of what the West can do, I think, um, well, firstly, there are a number of uh, frameworks and kind of industries or instruments that exist to facilitate defense innovation, you know, in, in what, including in UAVs and obviously robotics. Um, one of them is Diana. It's a um, defense, um, I want to say industrial accelerator, but it's essentially a startup accelerator under the NATO auspices. Um, and um, Ukraine, so Ukrainian startups don't currently have um, access to it, but it's, you know, for me, it's an easy win. It, it could be done. And I think it, it should be done. Um, the other kind of aspect of it is um, um, helping kind of Ukraine uh, work out its own defense innovation um, understanding and acquisition mechanism as well because I think you can have as vibrant of a supply side as you want right like I mean you can have these kind of super ingenious amazing examples but I think if um, if there is no kind of systematic way that lasts beyond the war you know and and is not kind of like this very creative stopgap measure of just coming up with an email address of acquiring mm -hmm. that innovation and bringing it to scale and and um, you know bringing it to kind of exploitation by the armed forces it's going to unfortunately wither away and die and the um 
Ukraine's allies in, in kind of NATO and beyond have a lot of experience with addressing these challenges. So I think um, helping, you know, you, know, you know, helping Ukraine build a defense ecosystem that works for Ukraine um, would be another hugely important aspect. Uh, German, so German um, innovation and support, right, or support, German support to Ukrainian defense innovation. I mean, to be honest, I haven't seen anything from Germany in um, in particular, um, other than I think there is, um, you know, a pretty kind of interesting, sexy German drone startup that has been supplying Ukraine um, early on. Um, I think, again, I mean, I, I'm not, just because I'm not aware of it doesn't mean that it's not happening. There are a lot of, uh, I think, efforts happening at the bilateral level as well, or initiatives. You know, they haven't yet emerged um, to the level of effort. Um, and um, I think Germany has actually a lot of potential as well and could offer a lot of insight. Okay, that's, that's interesting. And it wouldn't be as, you know, as like hand-wringing, uh, hand-wringingly difficult as supplying tanks. So you should really consider it. Yeah. Uh, Fair enough. Um, Dan, I asked that question, but okay, here we go. Uh, although it appears that Russian commercial aviation is struggling, is there any information on Russia transitioning commercial air resources into the VKS where there is transfer is feasible, for example, mechanics, components, et cetera? Thanks, so, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I hadn't really thought about um, I haven't seen anything specifically, um, and I haven't seen much beyond the stories of uh, of, of a widespread kind of cannibalization. And also, um, I think there was stories of, about putting together a, a system for cert certifying kind of cannibalized uh, parts in the Russian press. Um, and I think it's a really good point. You obviously got some similar skills there. Um, I guess one of the questions would be how long uh, it would take to kind of reorient some uh, engineers and technician skills um to, to work more in in, in in a military context um i think as well if russia has reduced air traffic if it's flying uh, fewer um civil aircraft um and i, th I think you know there are restrictions on on flights in different different directions you, you get a kind of a lower demand uh from the civil sector um but then at the same time if if you're um running short of supplies and you're having to kind of use cannibalized parts and stuff there's probably a higher demand for engineering and expertise to keep those fewer planes flying um and then also i, I wonder as well how many um engineers and technicians uh and, and sort of kind of support that russia had that, that was from uh, western companies has been withdrawn uh you know i was thinking there to the the uh, tomcat case where it was 800 grumman engineers uh left in in really quick uh short short time frame and, and they had to really struggle to adapt there. Um, so yeah, it would definitely be interesting to see more data here. Uh, one, one thing that we have seen that, that's kind of interesting though, and I wonder whether uh, Russian uh, civil uh, operators are getting involved in this to support the military effort is um, we've seen cases where uh, Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, um, you know, civil civil um, body um, has been, uh, you know, used as a, as a kind of a procurement uh, Body or has been used as an excuse to procure um, uh, dual use and, and complex technologies, and, and I know Rosatom as well has said that it's be willing to sort of support the procurement mission uh, as, as well. So that's the state nuclear um, uh, uh, company. Um, so I wouldn't really be surprised if uh, civil aviation channels also aren't being used to obtain uh, components, and uh, obviously a lot of the the stuff that goes into civil air airliners is very. Uh, high-end electronics as well, um, uh, although maybe not military grade. Um, and yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's being used, even if it is also illegal in, in some way under the sanctions regime. But so thanks. Interesting question. Amazing. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to... Ooh, Julia. What is the state of counter UAV technology being used by either Russia or Ukraine in this conflict? Oof, yeah, good is question. Is Ukraine promoting acquisition of these as much as UAV, uh, as much as UAVs and loitering munitions? Yeah. Um, well, I will focus on Ukraine because you know I think there are enough people um, kind of looking at the Russian side. Um, I have been so yes, uh, counter. 
UAV solutions have been like a secondary almost focus. Well, for me, not not necessarily for Ukraine. Um, um, in you know, in connection with looking at sort of what's happening in the um, in the UAV space, it is. I will say that it is a major um, focus right now. Um, so a lot of the kind of startup activity that I described, or um, you know, the the sort of drone experimentation um, activity, has now shifted, or has shifted. I would say probably from uh, I don't know, maybe September um, of 2022 sort of onwards to trying to uh, come up with counter various counter UAV solutions. Um, I think if I had to say like relative prioritization, you know, um, of acquisition by Ukraine or kind of um, development, um, I think it, as you might expect, it has probably followed it, right? So um, it is a major focus now. It's probably not yet as prominent in terms of um you know kind of the well number one the media attention and therefore the 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 research understanding that we have um and probably in terms of the um battle ready solutions that the ukrainian innovation space is producing but it is obviously something um that ukraine has repeatedly requested um help on from um from allies uh and partners as i said it is it is also um you know it's no less vibrant space let's let's um let's put it that way you know i think th those same startups that i talked about um are also working on um counter uh uav solutions amazing um dan russia has relied on illicit procurement for many years you spoke about some cases from the 1980s, what's new and what has changed? Thanks, that's, a, that's another great question. And I, it's one that I'm interested in to the point where I'm, I'm basically working on a book on, on that. Um, and yeah, I think I think there's a, there's a lot of, of, of kind of similar characteristics and, and, and themes and trends that are really, um, I mean, illicit procurement has always been about um, deception um, and, and deceiving. Uh, export controllers and intelligence agencies and, and industry um or so, sometimes um you know not not deceiving so much um and then i guess you get into the definition of what is illicit and what isn't and and you know there's a whole kind of gray area there um but but i think what i guess what we've seen maybe is that you are seeing the same types of things um uh, and the same activities and acts just performed through different uh mediums um so so all these always been demand driven networks um you know, quite a lot of the time they've been run by intelligence operatives or, or kind of people that sit between intelligence, uh, you know, Russian state intelligence and, and kind of state commercial um, kind of purchasing organizations or, or, or just, just business more generally. Um, they, they extensively use kind of third country hubs or third countries. So um, you know, you base yourself somewhere that isn't Russia, and you make it really difficult to to work out that this the, the, this country that you're sat in, whether it's the UAE or Hong Kong or anywhere, um, is 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 uh, you know not something that the exporter should be worried about. Um, and then it's I guess traditionally it's been a lot about uh, falsifying paperwork, um, you know, adapting as as necessary to avoid an enforcement. Um, and and I guess the the way that maybe that we we've, we've seen things change a little bit um, is is you know now it's it's uh, all about email, uh, business to business websites, um, you know Alibaba, um, you know these online marketplaces that provide huge opportunities as, as well as the sort of more traditional you know going to trade fairs and shopping and and, and making business connections. Um, and I guess the other the other thing as well that maybe we've seen change a, a little bit is is um, some different third countries, um, you know, third countries will um, become more or less appealing for these networks, depending on the amount of enforcement activity that's going on there, the amount of interest that say US and Western intelligence are, are playing in, in or have in these in these kinds of activities, um, you know, different uh, social and economic trends that um, you, you, you might get um, a certain economy is becoming more developed, so then it, it becomes easier to order advanced goods there because it it seems like they might actually be used there rather than being transferred onto somewhere else. 
Um, and, and I guess the social aspect as well that I like to, to talk about is that um, you you get um, you know different social reasons that that different groups of of uh, middlemen and intermediaries or middlewomen and, and uh, might might want to use different jurisdictions. It's maybe that they know people there, they have higher level political cover. Um, you know, you, there's a certain level of, of corruption and nepotism that allows them to operate without too many problems. So I think that's, you know, there's a lot of stuff there that is the same. And, and you know, looking at documents from the 1950s um, and, and finding that, that, that you know, here's a, here's a list of uh, procurement modus operandi that, that really is the same as now. And, but then also new technologies and, and you know, general political trends as well um, mean that, that these networks do change a little bit over time. That's me. That's fascinating. Um, Julia, to what extent do you think tactical UAV use can replace traditional control of the air for Ukrainian armed forces? So in a nutshell, they can't. Um, because um, I think, you know, they do, that's, you know, my, my view. I, um, they, they, those um, capabilities do really, really quite different things. Um, so, you know, tactical drones, um, of course, have been essential to kind of um, ISR and scale, um, have given Ukraine that, that scale um, that it needs to mount those kinds of um, operations, uh, you know, they're, out of necessity, they've obviously been equipped with like DIY, DIY strike capability, but there is no um, substitute for kind of establishing control of, um, um, of the airspace or um, you know, kind of uh, leveraging the air domain to win a war and kind of mount lethal force at scale, um, especially in the um, in the case of of Ukraine and and, and the current war. If um, you know Russia becomes more kind of, or Russian air force becomes more um, risk, you know. Uh, risk happy with using its um, aircraft against Ukraine following any potential um, counteroffensive by Ukraine, then, you know, tactical drones ain't gonna cut it. Yeah. Dan, to, pick you off, uh, to piggyback off of your previous question with regards to illicit procurement, the sort of deepening relationship between Iran and Russia, do you think that um, this is a little bit selfish because I'm actually kind of writing about this, but do you think that there are lessons that Russia can draw from Iran, the Iranian experience? Yeah, so that's this really interesting. I, I wrote a piece about this with a, with a colleague at Rusi. Um, over, it was published uh, between Christmas and New Year, really, so probably everyone missed it. Um, but but I guess in, in terms of the maybe direct lesson learning uh, is, is difficult to prove. Um, and I, I, I guess as well that um, Iran, you know, pr can provide, uh, you know, 40 years, I guess, or more of experience uh, in that in that space. Uh, you know, Russia can provide uh, 70, 80, 90, 100. I mean, it depends where you want to start stop counting. Like I, in, in, in this book project, I'm actually starting to look even in the 1920s, when the pretty early days of of kind of Soviet international uh, trading uh, organizations and infrastructure uh, was was starting to be put into place. Um, you know, I, th I think that there is there's definitely scope for networks to to be leveraged, and you know, there may be ways that that Iran has found to get hold of certain things easily that that could help Russia. Um, but then also, I guess Iran, there, there could be a case of competing demand there as well, and and. Um, you know, the the uh, illicit networks, I guess, are, are smaller than kind of um, legitimate international trading networks as well. So you have to be wary that in, in this kind of smaller space, maybe there's more scope for competition too. Um, so so I, it's, it's kind of a mixed and messy picture. And, and as always with these, these kinds of uh, understanding these illicit networks, the, the data set is very limited. Um, and... and um, yeah, I think as a, as a brand, I'd say Iran is probably almost more tarnished than uh, than Russia is at the moment. So, um, you know, if you're if you're a, an industry and you receive um, suspicious inquiries originating in both places, I don't know which one you'd you'd, you'd be less likely to want to to pick. <laughs> oh God! But it's, it's something we can discuss more. I think it is really interesting how how it's it, that relationship is developing right now. Well, yeah, I mean, so there has been some sort of overlap with like 
sanction circumvent, you know, circumventing sanctions. Yeah. Some kind of and, like, I, and that's the only other thing I think is that sanctioned countries and sanctioned economies tend to, to trade a lot with each other because they, you know, they don't don't have uh, it, it is easy, you know, say they don't have a lot of other options. They also said illicit procurement, it can be very easy. Um, but 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 I, I guess um, you know if you're if you're kind of uh, in this in this kind of pariah zone together, uh, then you, you might kind of at least try and benefit from what each other can 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 offer. Oh God. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just uh, there's there are more questions in here. So before I kind of get carried away with my own. Um, oh, what did I do with that question was? Sorry. Uh, here we go. Um, did I ask that? Just... Julia, did I ask this question? Can you provide some examples of ways allies can support UAV innovations? And also, what can you the Ukrainians do? Yes, you did. Um, I would, yeah, but I, I mean, no, 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 not in that way. I would quickly just add one thing. I think <laughs> one thing that um, I think allies can do that's a relatively that I haven't mentioned that's a relatively you know easy win to be honest is to actually um, create a framework by which um, um, Western or you know NATO whatever uh, however whatever phrase you want to use um, defense innovators can actually collaborate with Ukrainian developers away as well um, in a structured way you know kind of going beyond this ad hoc you know let's try to find some guys on Twitter and LinkedIn and then talk to them and find out what they need a lot of it that's that's how it's happening right right now um, yeah <laughs> on TikTok dance moves um, is there anything Ukraine needs to do to improve and consolidate its defense innovation? Well, I think, yeah, I, I did hint at this. Um, I think a lot of what I described, you know, this kind of like um, upstart activity, I guess, uh, that's, that's happening is by necessity quite ad hoc. Um, you know, it is um, obviously driven by, um, uh, by the war. So Ukraine really needs to embed and systematize it, right? And I think a huge chunk of it is actually um, understanding how defense innovation um, can and should be integrated into um, the defense industrial base and kind of um, the capability cycle um, and the inventory eventually of um, of Ukraine and um, and you know even understanding the potential of technology how you acquire innovation how you differentiate between different um, technological solutions what the value of it is and then of course work out the processes to um, to enable it um, I think that that's going to be a major effort. Yeah. Uh, Dan, you've studied arms embargoes across the board for a while. Where do you think they bite the most? Is it air power, air forces, aerospace, rather than land and sea? So, so um, I mean, I think, I think it really depends on a lot of factors. I mean, this is a typical academic response, right? <laughs> Having studied it for a long time, um, but but obviously um, you know it depends a lot on the state's existing capability, uh, defense industrial base capability, uh, you know who who they're trying to compete with as well. Like a, a lot of the cases that I um, I looked at, uh, sort of the the, the Rhodesias and South Africas of the of of, of history, um, they were they were not really competing with other advanced air forces. You know they. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, they had a high degree of air superiority to begin with. Um, uh, you know, I think it depends a lot what you're trying to trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, and and I. But I do think air power is always something that has been uh, kind of inherently challenging. Uh, you know, obviously involves higher end technologies, uh, things like materials. Uh, de you know, developing engines is very challenging. Uh, advanced electronics, avionics, optics, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, to to do it well. Um, but then there are also other other areas of, of defense you know if you're if you're uh, building radars for for marine um kind of use uh if if you're building missiles uh you know for other applications as well you you're gonna you're gonna be requiring some of the same sort of high-end technologies as well so you know i think i think it is challenging um for for air, air power and aviation um, um and i think but but also 
it can be challenging for other other applications as well and it's all very dependent on context yeah so the historian in me um really enjoys this question some of the cases that you use are really old was the game <laughs> sorry even and though it's dad's so, question i have to no no that's that's fair and i i mean i, I that in the paper the cases aren't quite as old as in the presentation so i you know, you're probably all grateful I didn't didn't go on to a sort of ramble on on Ethiopian capabilities in the in the 19th. I feel like if it or... happened in the last century, it's not really history. <laughs> yeah, no, I um. So so yeah, I think um. Yeah, it is it is difficult and in a way to to generalize and I yeah the technology is very different right. Um, you know, even if you go back to 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 say uh, Rhodesia, I mean, I, I reading about Rhodesia they. They had a, uh, a a transport aircraft that was flying in 1979 before um, the country became Zimbabwe that actually had uh, drop paratroopers at Arnhem Bridge in, in 1944, I think it was. Um, so, uh, you know, they're running hunt hunters and cameras, which is like what the UK, I guess, was running in the 50s. Um, you can't really compare that with 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 Russia trying to develop these next generation systems now I and mean, the aircraft have become so much more complicated and and there's been some really interesting work done on, on this that, that tries to kind of capture the the, the changes in, in in the complexity um but at the same time you know i think there are some kind of similar challenges that you can talk about um the responses over time are actually kind of weirdly similar as well and, and that's how i was able to kind of capture them in that framework i hope and i guess ultimately um you know it's it's humans and it, it's technology and it's about how they how they interact and it's it's about um you know issues of technology of, of absorption of technology um and and i think a lot of the literature on kind of technological diffusion uh really talks about that absorb absorptive absorption capacity sorry I'm missing missing my words here now um as being really important you know as much as as it is about kind of mastering the technology it's about the organizations and, and the culture and, and those kind of softer factors in in how how you can um absorb the technology that determines how well it it, it diffuses no that's fascinating i'd love to continue this conversation at some point um so it looks that unless there are any other questions, I want to thank everyone who joined us today, particularly Dan and Julia. Thank you guys. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and insights. I think that at this point, it's no secret that I find both of your work absolutely fascinating. And I look forward to whatever you have coming up next and continuing the collaboration with FASI, you know. Um, as for our audience. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the event. Um, and if you like this, you will love what we have in store for you. So please join our mailing list to keep abreast of our upcoming publications and events. Once again, we will be hosting our summer event on the evening of June 22nd at King's College. It will not be virtual. Uh, for more detail, please join our mailing list via our website or the link in the chat box. Um, hosted by my uh, colleague, Orla, who's um, the other star of today. Thank you so much for helping setting this event up. Um, thank you again to everyone for joining and have a lovely rest of the day.